Welcome to Reputation Matters. So we've all heard of the hit TV show Shark Tank, but what would it be like to be the person behind the scenes keeping the water and the proverbial tank calm and the sharks at bay, or tamed as it were? So our guest today is just that man. He helped Mark Cuban complete around 100 business deals on the hit show Shark Tank. He's an entrepreneur in his own right. He truly understands the power of brand and reputation. And more recently, he helped launch the Dallas, Texas-based company Legacy Night. They're a premier multi-family office platform. And more importantly than that, Abe Mankara is just my dear friend. In fact, what a lot of people don't know is that we were dating our wives at the exact same time 20 years ago, uh, and, and we've been happily married to each of them ever since. Abe Mankara, welcome. Thanks for joining us on Reputation Matters. Thanks for having me, my friend. Okay, so I have to ask you first and foremost, what is it like to work for Mark Cuban? It is, um, it's a great experience. I mean, it's a privilege to work with someone as distinguished and accomplished it as he is. And um, it's been really, truly a very unique experience. You learn a lot. Yeah. Um, you're always on and you have exposure to a lot of different investments. Um, obviously Shark Tank was one of them, yeah. which was a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, but we also invested in, in other types of businesses as well. So now I want to talk about that, but before we move off Mark, I mean, I remember you telling me at one time he works always by email. Everything is by, by email. What, what's that like? And, and especially in a pre-COVID world. That's a superpower. Um, I mean, keep in mind, it's a large organization and everyone emails Mark and he responds to every email. Yeah. Not just internal, external. Um, so he, he has that ability to just, um, self-manage all of all of his incoming emails and um, responds to every one. I mean, if let's say if you're sending him an investment opportunity, um, he'll immediately say, no thanks, not for me. Or if he's interested, tell me more. Yeah. But he'll respond. And he does it all himself? All himself. Yeah, I've had a couple of situations where for civic activities we wanted him to speak. Yeah. And I think I think even you were like just email him, and sure enough, he he whether it's yes or no, it's astounding that he gets right back to you. Do you is is he aware, or does he think about the perception of him, uh, or or whoever he is by doing that, by being so personal, by being so responsive? Is he aware of the the power of that kind of responsiveness? I think so. I think it's intentional. Um, back to the brand, the power of the brand. I think he has an amazing brand and he's been building it over, over the years and just gets better and better. And his, his commitment to his brand and to his, his mission, basically to empower entrepreneurs. Um, and it's something that I learned from him, um, even to this day, and I'll explain a little bit more what we do at Legacy Night, but we invest at kind of a growth stage um, businesses, uh, even early stage companies that still reach out to me, yeah. I still respond to every email. And um, kind of it's, for me, it's better to respond and say, you know, you're not a fit for us. These are the criteria for us to invest in you. When you get to that stage, definitely reach out. In the meantime, let me give you some advice on what you should, who you should be connecting with. Um, and happy to help you out just at a high level on the direction of the company. And then if they come back, great. Yeah. But at least I kind of commit myself to take that step versus just not responding at all because it's not a fit. Well, it's, right? a, it's a powerful lesson because you never know who, you're, who is going to be your friend later. You never know. Right? Yeah. And you never know when you might need something. For, you know, I remember my mentor taught me, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, never pass up an opportunity yeah. to do a favor. And sometimes the, just the power of a response. Exactly. Have you noticed his brand, his personal reputation evolving? And let me tell you what I mean. I mean, when I first started, of course, you, you, it was the Yahoo sale. And then it was the owner of the Mavericks. And, and my impression in so many ways was the guy who would sit, you know, under the basket and scream at the referees. But that almost seems like ancient history now. His, his brand has changed so much. What, what are your observations about his, his brand and who he is? 
Yeah, it's continually evolving, right? Um, there's always a, a bigger platform um, that Mark is going to be going after. Um, you know, Shark Tank was a great platform, um, and it really aligned with um, what I believe is its mission to be kind of a someone an, an ambassador, someone who empowers entrepreneurship in the country, in the U.S. and around the world now. Um, you know, now that the Shark Tank is um, is viewed all over the world through the syndication on CNBC, um, and I think though, but there's other things. I mean, if you look at some of the more recent projects that Mark is working on, like Cost Plus Drug Company, I mean that is a really disrupt disruptive business model, and I think he's going to. It's another way for Mark to just elevate his brand and, and make a difference, change the world, and do something good. Yeah. And uh, if I don't know if you've noticed, but Cost Plus Drug Company in a very short period of time has been able to provide so much value for individuals needing access to drugs, generic drugs. Um, and what his platform offers is Cost Plus. So, you, so it's really helping people uh, that are in need to get access to the medication at a more affordable price than what's currently available in the market. Tell me a little bit about your role with him. Did you ever find yourself in a position where you were giving him advice on his reputation or his personal brand? Like, Mark, that's not a good idea. You're going to come off this way. Or, hey, you're being, you are already perceived this way if you do that. Or, or did it, was it more on the deals? It was more on the deals. Yeah, I think Mark's got everything else covered, um, <laughs> so he's really good at it. Um, on the deal side, yeah, I mean, obviously there's a lot of deals um, in his portfolio, and it's just a matter of basically sometimes um, maybe a slight miscommunication could create um, some contention, in, and it's just about just clarifying and the messaging and um, making sure everyone has all the information relevant to the situation so um, you can get back to more of a constructive conversation yeah. and not kind of spiral into a lot of um, conflict and drama. And you see that a lot with um, early stage companies and entrepreneurs. The way they communicate with their investors, um, it's, and sometimes it comes from the entrepreneurs themselves. They're just not used to communicating um, to their investors, maybe they, they've never had investors before, they're running their own ship, and, yeah. and now they get to a stage where they need that growth capital, and they bring on these new investors. There's a certain dynamic, though, you, it, in terms of how you communicate to investors, because there's a certain expectation now. You have partners. Yeah. And, um, they want to make money. They want to make money, but they also want to support you. Hmm. So. Um, what we've seen is where there is a mis usually a lack of communication and from a branding perspective. You know, at an early stage, the founder uh, CEO is really the the representation of the brand of the company. Yeah. Um, and when early stage investors are looking at, you know, you've heard the term investing in the in the you know, in the, betting on the jockey, right? Yeah. And and that's what investors do at an early stage. Um, it's all about the entrepreneur's ability to execute, and the better communicator he or she is, the better chance they have to kind of navigate through all the challenges and use their um, their network of investors, advisors, to overcome all these challenges because they're always going to be challenges. Well, because in a way they're salespeople, right? yeah. but without it seeming salesy. Right? They're either salespeople or they're technical people, right? Yeah. All right, I have to ask you, sorry, last question on Cuban. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I promise. What is the best, well, it's two questions in one. What's the best piece of advice you ever gave him that he took? What's the best piece of advice you ever gave him that he didn't take? Can you remember? The best piece of advice I gave him? Yeah. I don't think I've given him any advice. <laughs> I was on the receiving end. I got a lot of great advice from Okay. Him. Yeah. And, you know, the one Thing that resonates is, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's all about sales. It doesn't matter what business you're in, without sales, you're dead. So always keep that in mind. And you're always selling, no matter what part of the business you're kind of focusing your efforts. 
everybody should have their sales hat on at every time. Back to, to the branding side, whenever an employee goes out and is facing with clients, vendors, prospects, um, they're always a representation of your brand. Yeah. So that's something to keep in mind. And as the leader of that organization, you have to be kind of the top ambassador. Right. And you kind of push that to your employees. And if you can do that, then you have um, a pretty good foundation because that's where the, kind of the, the cultural aspect, um, your employees tend to be more loyal to the firm, uh, more fulfilled and, and more aligned with the mission of the company, right? Yeah. Because that's what you want. You want your employees to be your brand ambassadors and you want like, your customers to be your brand ambassadors. And if you can do those two right, I think you're, you're, on, your way. you're on your way. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about Shark Tank and what your role was. So how, how did it work? Cuban would say, I mean, obviously said no, if he said no, he's out and you never see him or hear from the, the investment opportunity again. But if he said yes, what would happen behind the scenes and what was your role? Shark Tank, the whole season, it usually airs in October, ends in May, um, is filmed earlier that year. They do a week in June and a week in September where they lock all the sharks in the studios from day to night and they bring out of 40,000 at the time applicants, they're na narrowed down to about 150. Wow. And those entrepreneurs get to pitch. And the average pitch would last probably about an hour. Um, on TV, they, they edit it down to maybe like three to five minutes. Yeah. Um, so it's a true pitch. And so there's a lot of back and forth. It's completely non-scripted, no retakes. So if you screw up, there's a good chance the editors might put, put that segment on TV because it creates some more drama. Uh, <laughs> uh, but that's the beauty of the show. It's a completely non-scripted show. Um, whatever happens on the show is to some degree kind of packaged in that segment. And when you see a shark walk up to the entrepreneurs and give them kind of commit to a deal and do a handshake deal on it. It's a true commitment to invest, assuming no red flags in, in the diligence phase. So let's say a shark would commit to 10 deals in June, right? Those 10 deals, every shark has a team that would start working on each, with each one of those entrepreneurs. And they have a checklist making sure the sales numbers that they pitched in, um, are accurate. You know, uh, their financials are what they claimed they were. Um, the IP that they, they claimed actually holds um, and can be protected. And then any commitments they had from, let's say, vendors yeah. that they were using kind of to, to close their pitch are there. Could be a variety of things, the lawsuits they didn't disclose. You never know. But if any of those kind of um, check, check off as a red flag, then most likely the deal's off. And so even though on the show, you might see a handshake shake deal, in reality, that, that investment didn't happen. So it's not, it's, if, if the investment happens, doesn't happen later, it's not necessarily a foregone conclusion that the handshake won't appear on the show. Like it could still appear on the show even though later down the road the deal yeah, falls so, apart. Yeah, so in the earlier seasons, um, you would more likely see a handshake deal, yeah. and after the fact, the company did not actually close with the shark. I think in, more, most, in the more recent um, seasons of Shark Tank, they've changed that. Yeah. And uh, they've, they've noticed it created some confusion, and there were also some entrepreneurs that taking, were taking advantage of that platform. Mm. So they were kind of doing anything it takes to get a handshake deal so they can get on the show and get the episode aired. And after the fact, they would just drag their feet because they didn't really want to give up equity. So it was a marketing ploy on There's the There's a few companies pictures. that got away with it. And then eventually, I think the, uh, the producers put together a new plan, which is, more, which is more geared towards making sure to only air companies 
that the sharks have already confirmed that they've closed on, well, which makes more sense. It, it makes more sense for the integrity of the show, but yeah. also it goes back to a tried and true like reputation. That's true. <laughs> 101, yeah. which is be honest, do the right thing, because if you don't, it's going to catch up with you later. Right. And I know that I know that sounds overly simplistic, but I mean, bottom line, that's that's always true. So, OK, so Cuban says yes, the deal goes through. What was your role? What did you do? So as part of the team, like our team made sure these companies, um, one, the first thing we need to do is we supported these companies at every level, right? We have we had existing companies. We're always bringing on new companies from Shark Tank. Um, we try to support them um, in our, from day one operationally, making sure that any of the operational gaps on day one um, through our net internal network, external network, try to support them. And the first requirement is to make sure that they can maximize the impact of the show because it's a big platform. Right. And it's for you to make it through all of the, the stages of going through kind of the email interviews or more like the American Idol type um, kind of pitches where you have to wait in line um, for a whole day to get a, an opportunity to pitch. Um, all filters down to the day you actually get invited to the studio and then your chances of actually getting an handshake deal and then closing the deal. So to get through all these stages, you want to make sure that, okay, you made it, but this is just the beginning. There's now, a ton of hurdles. There's a lot of hurdles. And this is your opportunity really to take your company through this amazing platform and, and try to give it as much exposure as possible. Now, from a branding perspective, Shark Tank already has this brand appeal, right? Yeah. So by associating your brand with Shark Tank, you already have kind of- Huge boost. A huge boost. And we've seen companies do some significant sales on their website. Um, the evening of air on Shark Tank and throughout the week, that weekend as well. Um, one of the challenges we had in the early days, um, websites used to crash. This was maybe, oh. I would say 15 years ago. Yeah. Um, that was kind of the biggest challenge is make there, at the time, there weren't enough robust e-commerce platforms out there that could support the traffic from Shark Tank. And so imagine going, watching this great pitch Going on their website, there's nothing there. You can't, so, you can't buy it. So it's a big miss. It was a big miss for all of these entrepreneurs because you're losing all that momentum. And the Shark Tank game really is you get on this platform and you want to maximize the momentum as much as you can. Yeah. Because the majority of companies after a year lose that Shark Tank effect. And a lot of them unfortunately get back to their pre-Shark Tank revenue norm. And the, the few exceptions that really do well keep growing and growing and growing. And, and from, again, a reputation perspective, what was the difference for, between the ones who kind of went back and then the ones who really propelled and kept going and going and going? What did they do? I mean, obviously, they took advantage of the Shark Tank yeah. platform, but at some point, weeks and weeks and weeks pass, they got to be doing something else. And you were kind of an internal consultant, it sounds like. Yes, I mean, we were we were p true partners with our entrepreneurs, trying to support them. Um, even though we didn't have controlling equity, um, we we tried to provide them as much um, um, support uh, because we, we you know we're looking after our invested investment in the company, yeah. right? So we would help them from preparing them for the initial launch on the show and then try to get them through all the momentum in, in, in terms of sales. Because once you have a, a more solid operational foundation, then you could scale, right? You can't just go to Walmart if you don't have your manufacturing, manufacturer um, ready for a Walmart order. Uh, you don't have the team and systems in place to manage a big order from an Amazon or a Walmart. So, you'll be missing out on the opportunity. So once you have the foundation, then you can go and really leverage the network. And that's one thing that we did really well is we started building a network of partners for all of our companies so we can help accelerate growth. But we need to make sure they have the right foundation to scale. So after the foundation, I mean, were you giving them marketing and PR advice 
to, to, for here's, here's what you need to do to protect your reputation, to get to the next level, to market yourself, to tell your story. Yeah, actually, yeah. We would give him high level advice on kind of lessons, what we've experienced in terms of what makes a successful company on Shark Tank. What are the things they should do to maximize their opportunity to thrive um, on the airing of the show and then beyond that? Um, and the thing is, like, even though we give the advice, not all the entrepreneurs follow our advice to the T. Um, but the ones that do, most of them actually really do well. Can you boil down the difference? Again, from more of the marketing side, the, one, the ones that made it and are still making it versus the ones that kind of fizzled out? What, again, from a reputation perspective, what, what was the difference? I guess the difference is because Shark Tank, if you look at it as a platform, it's a great platform for consumer product goods, yeah. right? Yeah. That's why you don't see a lot of like Services. B2B SaaS businesses yeah. there. Um, and the, the, the consumer of Shark Tank loves kind of that immediate gratification of going on the website and buying a product because they just fell in love with the entrepreneur and the idea, yeah. right? So if you're a consumer product, and so the successful ones usually are companies that appeal to the masses. That's why you know, some of the, the popular names, Scrub Daddy, you know, uh, uh, Squatty Potty, uh -huh. uh, uh, Dude Wipes. It's yeah. funny, they're all in the... In, yeah, in the, in the, they're, they're all in the, in the toilet. toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, they, you know, it's something that everybody could need, yep. right? And usually their price point's affordable. It's not something that is a luxury item. And those products do well, especially if you have a product that, um, you know, eventually could be on a subscription model. Yeah. And so you use your 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 branding on Shark Tank to really leverage your exposure, and then it's up to you as a brand to continually engage and provide more value to our customers over time. So you have to innovate too, right? right. You're never going to make it on Shark Tank with just one product. Um, it could be one product, but you have to, you know, you build around it. You mean you're never going to make it after Shark Tank? Well, you can't just, I mean, you can. We've seen companies that get on Shark Tank. It's always just a one product I hit, see. right? Got it, got it. And those are the ones who don't really evolve because one product brand, there's a few that really make it. Um, if you really want a big company, you have to really think about, now that you have the customer, what else can we provide that customer? Now that we have their trust, um, we've, we've done our job in terms of the, the brand that we're representing, the, the quality of product we're, we're providing. What else can we do to serve our client? And those are the companies that do well. You, you said something else a moment ago that I think is, is really important, which is if the viewers fall in love with the owner. And I think that's so important. We spend a lot of time talking about the role of the leader, the C-suite. Like, well, I'll deal with a lot of CEOs who will say like, oh, I want to push my people forward, or uh, we want to stay below the radar, uh, right? <laughs> but the fact is, is you can't have it both ways. You can't be wildly successful and stay below the radar. And there's only one CEO, yeah. right? There's only one leader. So why not it be you, right? Yeah. And use that, the power. And I think, I think your point is, is so important because if people love a great story, and even if the product is just so-so or maybe a little more expensive than they would ordinarily pay, if they really like the person and the personality behind it or their story, they're going to buy and maybe later invest. That's right. I mean, that's why a lot of celebrity brands these days, you're seeing a lot more of them because they have fans. People love their celebrities and whatever the celebrity offers as a product, right. there's a good chance they're going to buy it. Right. Even if it's crap. Even if it's crap, yeah. <laughs> Not to continue the pun. But, but on Shark Tank, I mean, that's why, what I love about it. It's, it's a great, the way I see it, it's one of the best educational platforms on TV. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, it's great when I hear my friends um, kind of watch Shark Tank with their kids. Yeah. And their kids are becoming kind of savvy in entrepreneurs, investors at a very young age. And you know, it's great when you see like a 12 year old girl on Shark Tank entrepreneur go, go on the show and get a deal from a shark. So 
imagine if you're a 12 year old boy or girl watching kind of someone your age getting a deal from one of the sharks with an idea that she actually took from the ideation phase to a, a product and was able to navigate through all these different challenges to get on the show and get a deal. You're like, I could do this. Yes. Yeah. And I think it's very impactful. Yeah. So uh, fast forward, you almost six years ago left four four and a half years okay ago. all right all right I'm, I'm giving you too yeah. much time <laughs> so left cuban companies and co-founded legacy night yes um so first of all why and and what is legacy night so legacy night is um is a boutique multifamily office and basically at a high and level for those who don't know what does that mean so I'll tell you something that will lead into it. So let's say to summarize with, with Mark, I used to support entrepreneurs from startup to all the way to an exit when they sell their business or get acquired, right? With Legacy Night, now I'm supporting entrepreneurs after their big liquidity event when they sell their business. Got it. So it's kind of the next part of the journey um, in working with entrepreneurs at this next phase of life. Um, which is very satisfying too. Now, Legacy Night, um, what is a multifamily office? So a multifamily office is, I guess in, in layman's terms, it's a wealth management group yeah. that supports ultra high net worth investors or um, families or individuals. So basically you have a family office, which is kind of a new term that you're hearing these days, yeah. basically is a family or a family that has significant wealth where they have, they can justify hiring a team, so it's almost like a business, to manage your portfolio instead of having everything outsourced uh, to different firms. You have a team that manages your investment strategy manages kind of all the different asset classes you're investing in. They source investment opportunities, are very proactive in it. They do the diligence and are aligned with the overall strategy and legacy of the family over time. Yeah. Um, now, at what point can you, can you justify hiring a team? I mean, if you're at a billion plus, you can easily justify hiring a team, right? <laughs> I can imagine. And most billionaires have their own family office. Sure. Um, what a multi-family office is, is it's a team. It's, it's almost like having that high, kind of a, um, a highly, um, um, a highly professional team of family office investment experts that put together the platform, similar to family office, but they, the back end is all shared from, by all the different families that are part of that group. Okay. Could be 10 families, could be 100 families, right? But what, what each family is getting is a much lower cost to a family office platform right. versus doing it on their own. And then on the investment side, the team has access to a lot of different investment opportunities. So their access getting you kind of the best deals that are out there um, is, is exponential at that point. And, and you get the kind of the power of sizing up as one group when you invest versus having to go and compete for those deals on your own with a smaller check size. So there's power as a group and, there, and one may have investment opportunities for the other yeah. that, that's brokered all through, through, exactly. through you. Yeah. yeah. So, when you are bringing these opportunities to the families that you represent or that work for you, is it all? Is it just about the numbers, or does the reputation of either the firm or the fund play a role in the advice? And if so, how so? Of course, um, like when because it's when you're investing in a business or investing in a fund. I mean, you're investing in people. Right? You're investing in, in their track record, especially you know, with the fund managers. Um, you're investing in the reputation of the, the managing partners. Um, it's all about reputation. Um, and the same thing with investing directly with a founder CEO, right? In your diligence, if, 
you know, you talk to their employees, you talk to their other investors and, and board advisors, you talk to um, uh, their vendors and, and try to assess kind of what type of individual is, is kind of going to be running the ship that you're investing in. And it, so, like I said, it could be a fund, it could be a, a company. And same thing with the fund managers. I mean, we are investing in their ability to execute on their strategy over and over and deliver results. Um, and ideally, you know, they just exceed the expectations at all times. Has there ever been a situation where the numbers looked really good, but there was something about either blatantly the reputation of, of the firm or fund or um, even you mentioned people, the yeah. feeling you got where it raised a red flag and you, you told one of your knights, as you call them, or one of your family investors, you know what, I, I don't, the numbers look good, but I don't feel good about this. It happens a lot, especially, I mean, we see deals come our way all the time. Um, and we also leverage our network um, just to, to check on um, the individuals that are running that investment strategy. Because, uh, and a lot of deals fall through just because, you know, great business model, um, great team, but the founder, um, there's just something about his reputation that um, is not where you need it to be. So it's not flying colors from everyone. And that kind of puts, puts a pause on the investment. Yeah. Um, and, we, and it's across the board too, like we've seen some, and all it takes is one mistake sometimes to mess your reputation. Um, I know a situation, I can't say who it is, but say it's a well-known billionaire um, that ended up kind of not really do, being a great fiduciary for his investors mm -hmm. and it really messed up his reputation. As a result, anything for us that's associated with that individual, we're not going to invest in. And all it takes is just the one. one. And so it's, you know, it's really hard to build trust. It's really hard to build a, a great reputation and it's all about maintaining it because if you mess up um, and you're in, the, in that business, you know how difficult it is to kind of yeah. reverse the damage that's done from well, a reputational basis. I mean, even it was Warren Buffett, right, who was like, you can do a thousand good things, but one, one bad day, one bad reputation yeah. can ruin, ruin the, whole, that's right. the whole deal. So where did Legacy Night come from? What's the story? So great question. So Legacy Night, um, initially, we were going to go with, because in the ultra high net worth wealth management space, it's all about legacy, right? You're, you're protecting the family's legacy over the years. You're kind of extending it through multiple generations if you do it right, right? Um, so the, I, the initial kind of concept was a legacy multifamily office. Um, when we started with a legacy multifamily office, for me, from a branding perspective, it was too generic, it, right? And I remember Googling legacy multifamily office to see what is out there, and we were lost. Um, and I remember organically, like maybe two senior living facilities popped up. Sure. As on top of the, uh, the Google search page, and they're like, this is not where we want to belong. So I've, we were looking for an anchor for legacy, and then just kind of, um, when we found our office space uh, that we're still in now, it was on Knight Street. And we, when, the moment we walked into that office space, we said, okay, this is, this is where our business is going to be born. And something clicked with that night. Um, legacy night started had a nice ring to it. Um, and then we built kind of the story around it. The night is a protector of the family's legacy. Right? The knight is a strategic piece on the chessboard. And then the best part, the domain was only 10 bucks, <laughs> LegacyKnight.com. Um, so it, it, and that's kind of how it came together. And Legacy Knight uh, became a brand. I remember we, we, had, we were talking about Legacy Knight, multi, like MFO or multifamily office as our domain. We said, no, we're a brand. 
Legacy Night. That's it. We'll be known as a Legacy Night. And um, that's what happens. And now, because of those decisions we made, that were very intentional on day one, on, from a branding perspective, not only it helps us be um, kind of more recognizable in the space, because we're not a, just a generic legacy services firm. We're Legacy Night. We're different. We're our own brand. We're our, in our own category. And what's amazing is it really worked out from an SEO perspective. So if you Google leg, um, multifamily office Dallas or family office Dallas, we're either first or in the top five organic searches. Fantastic. Which is amazing. Which for us is a big deal because we're an industry where we, you, we don't market, we don't advertise. It's all about reputation. It's all about word of mouth. But so when people search and find you, that's, you already have a head start. You have been an entrepreneur. Through Shark Tank, you mentored entrepreneurs. In your personal life, you've mentored entrepreneurs. Do you feel like you're a long ways away from that now, dealing with high net? It's, I, I don't necessarily think of a, someone who's reached billionaire status as still being an entrepreneur. <laughs> well, here's, here's where it is, because like the majority of our families are entrepreneurs yeah. who so we're, what's, I guess what's great about what we do is truly providing value for these entrepreneurs. Because a lot of entrepreneurs, they work all their lives to get to a point where they've created enough value in their company that someone's willing to pay a lot of money to acquire it. And, but they never plan for what's next. What do I do when I have 100 million in my bank account? Yeah, How do I make sure I don't lose it, right? <laughs> right. Um, so, but what's great about entrepreneurs is the entrepreneurs, even after a big liquidity event, they might take a pause for a year, but then they're going to be back in the game. They're either going to be back to create impact, because entrepreneurs want to create impact. And a lot of them will go back and do it in a, a for-profit manner, because they know how to do that. And some might just say, I want to create impact in a, in a kind of philanthropic, philanthropic way, and that's where they focus all their energy. Some do both, um, but we love entrepreneurs that are back in the game, yeah. and they're they're out to build the next billion, um, you know, billion dollar company, and it's usually more mission focused. You know, they've 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 learned a lot from their their first journey. Um, they were successful at it. And now they're going to be much more intentional on what they're going to build, the value they're going to create, and even intentional on who they expect to sell this company to. Because they don't want it to go to just anybody. Exactly. Yeah, they have a legacy to protect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I want to, our last chapter to be a little bit about you. Uh, so I mentioned you were an entrepreneur. Um, I remember when you launched... Um, uh, a cosmetic, a, a skincare product, bold for men. Yeah. Right? I, uh, I love your haircut. Thank I, you. I have aspirations. <laughs> I, I'm on my way, but I'm told that I would never look uh, uh, nearly as good as you do with your haircut. So um, this, this, well, why don't you talk a little bit about bold for men, what it was and why, why you created it? Yeah, so that was my first kind of entrepreneurial journey. And I wanted to, basically, I, I, you know, they say, if, if you want to start a business, where do you start? And usually it's, you have a pain point yeah. um, that you want to solve. Yeah. And for me, um, it was, I could not find the right grooming products for men for head shavers. Yeah. So I thought, well, let's go create one. Um, and that's what I did. Yeah. And um, the whole concept behind Bold is, and this was, in the days where you didn't really see a lot of people shaving their head. Now, a lot of people shave their heads. It's yes. becoming kind of a more common thing. But kind of the messaging was kind of, you know, own it, and you're not bald, you're bold. Right. That's kind of where the, the branding came from, right? And for me, it was great because I got to wear every hat as an entrepreneur and you do it all, and then as you grow as a business, you start delegating and hiring people. Um, so it was a great experience. And then same thing, I mean, with Legacy Night, 
even though we're, we're a multifamily office, it was a startup four years ago. We started with, um, you know, with, with one employee, we're two co-founders, and now we have a team of 16, and we're yeah, growing. You're growing. Yeah, but well, we had to wear every hat, you know, right. in the first year, all. we had you, to do it all. You were doing IT, right? At the yeah, beginning. yeah. I, I, I want to ask you one more question about Bold, though, and for, really from a reputation perspective, because if you think about it, then and now, not much has changed when it comes to marketing and reputation around men's hair care products, particularly around baldness. Yeah. Like it, it, it's terrible, right? I mean, terrible if you look at the pro A, the products that are out there, B, their brand reputation, and C, the way they market or talk about themselves. Well, I mean, this seemed perilous. How did you think about this? Or maybe you didn't. Like, I'm, I'm just going to plow in. And what did you do in order to differentiate yourself? Well, for me, um, I positioned the product as a premium product. So it, was, it, it wasn't, um, so it was a little bit more expensive. Yeah. But basically you're paying for quality. Right. And so that was part of our messaging and that was our positioning for the product. So I, I think that in you know wasn't wasn't like the the women's um, anti aging products that cost three, four hundred dollars. It's um, still affordable, but it was positioned as a premium product for men. Yeah. And I think that really helped us kind of get our niche in place. Yeah. And um, and allowed us to really engage with with our customers in providing something unique. Yeah, it was also a waterless shave, which was different, um, so it wasn't as messy. It was it was fun. It was fun working through the whole process with all the way from working with the chemists on day one um, to come up with the products, and then once you have the product, getting it to market. Uh, you have you have always been someone that strikes me as being aware of, maybe not in these words, but of your reputation and how you present yourself. In fact, I remember I found, literally, I, and we were talking about this not long ago, but over the weekend, I found when you and I met in 2003, you said, let me give you my card, and it was this thing, and it literally says, my card, my card. yeah. <laughs> right? And it has your, your uh, email address and phone number on that. That's great. What? principles of reputation have you adhered to as you've worked to build your own, your own brand through the different chapters of your career in life? Well, I think it's, it's a combination of hard work and, and integrity. Um, I think integrity is a big part of that. Um, the other thing is, and that's something Cuban used to say, is there's, there's nothing wrong with being nice. Just so um, I think it's just, you know, being reciprocal in, 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 in your relationships and, and trying to be there for kind of what we're talking about is always trying to be there for your friends, your family, your, your network, your colleagues, and then extend that. Um, and think about always how can you create value in anything you do? And value means also working on relationships, right? Um, yeah. So in everything you do, you, you always have to maintain a certain level of integrity, but you still have to put the work to maintain those relationships. And I think that's a big yeah. deal. Take the time. Take the time, yeah. yeah. All right, so we're gonna finish with a lightning round, right? <laughs> I love your eyes. Okay, okay so the first, First, these are questions uh, about about you in particular, and then these are then the, the 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 remainder of the questions are ones we ask every guest. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go quick. First, uh, what was your favorite invention or business on Shark Tank? The favorite invention or business on Shark Tank, I the the Power Pot. Okay. I the Power Pot was a a pot with a thermoelectric pad when you add water and put it over a source of heat, it generates a current so you can charge your phone wow. or um, off the grid. Okay. How about the craziest invention or business you saw on Shark Tank? Successful or I think not? the craziest in terms of a concept and how successful, crazily successful they've been, is dude products or dude wipes. Yeah. It's unbelievable. These guys are rock stars. Yeah. They're still crushing it. Yeah. 
Yeah, they're cleaning it up. So yeah, they're cleaning it up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, what's the number one piece of advice you give entrepreneurs? Never give up. There's okay. always a way. And what's the best piece of advice, either as an entrepreneur or a businessman or a human being or a man that you've ever been given? Be true to who you are. Yeah. Good. Okay, here we go. Favorite subject in school? Math. What did you major in in college? Um, engineering, computer engineering, and business. Now, you're from Lebanon, but yeah. grew up in France. France. Yeah. In France. Okay, great. So, favorite holiday? Christmas. Uh, favorite hobby? Skiing. Favorite guilty pleasure? Ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> favorite brand? Favorite brand? Um, Ferrari. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got good taste. Uh, is, that, is that advice you give to your knights? I think it's time to invest in a Ferrari. Uh, fa favorite movie? Um, a Few Good Men. Yeah, and uh, I, see, I thought you might say James Bond. Uh, That's two, yeah. You and I have this, uh, Abe and I have this old tradition where when the new James Bond movie would come out, or for a while it was when a new Star Wars movie would come out, because I had young kids, we'd meet at like 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock at night and go see the debut, so I didn't feel guilty when my kids were, that they were asleep, so okay. So James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> no, you don't have to change it. A favorite day of the week? Um, Thursday. Why? I guess it's just one day before the weekend, like you got, you're almost there. You're almost there. Uh, your hidden talent or superpower? I think my wife says my superpower is that I care. Yeah. Yeah, but you've got a, you, you have a genuineness yeah. about you for sure. Uh, if you could pick one person, alive or dead, to meet for dinner, who would you have dinner with? Today, I think I would, you know, Elon Musk yeah. would be an interesting guy. Um, just to, to meet one-on-one -on -one with and just talk about everything that he's doing yeah. and where he sees the future. And why did he change it to X? Yeah. <laughs> Abe and Cara, you're a, a dear friend, a lifelong friend. Thank you for Thanks joining us on Reputation Matters. From your years with Cuban to Shark Tank to Bold to now Legacy Night, congratulations on all your success and everything you're doing. And you truly, from a reputation perspective, walk the talk. So thank you all for joining us on Reputation Matters. We'll see you next time. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Reputation Matters. Find us at sunwestpr.com or your favorite podcast streaming service. Until next time. <laughs>